We are good to go when you're ready, Liz. Great. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome again to the Long-Term animal, animal Research Seminar Series. We continue this set of seminars with talks from Shaley Shaw and Dr. Dustin Rubenstein. And before I introduce our speakers, I want to make a couple of announcements. If you're participating via Zoom, you should see a Q&A tab at the top or bottom of your screen. If you open that tab, you'll be able to type any questions you have, as well as see and upvote other people's questions. So please use the Q&A tab for questions. At the end of the talk, we'll go through these questions on the Q&A tab, starting with the ones with the most votes. However, if you have a clarifying question that you feel like needs to be addressed during the talk in order for you to understand something, you can type clarification in capital letters at the start of your question. Our speakers have said they will do their best to answer those clarification questions in real time. Lastly, recordings of all of the talks will be available on YouTube shortly after they conclude. So if you need to leave early or know others who are unable to attend live, this talk will be available for viewing and reviewing after it's complete. All right, so now I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Shaylee Shaw, who is a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecology, Evolution and Environmental Biology at Columbia University. She's interested in social dominance, communication and sexual selection in birds. And Chile has worked on birds from all over the world, um, from studying alarm calls and herring gulls in North America, to studying Himalayan birds in India, to work on the suburb star starling in Kenya. Her research focuses on the ecology and evolution of dispersal using a combination of field experiments, population genetics, and long-term data. So today I'm looking forward to her talk on alternative male reproductive tactics and the formation of Mexican society. With that, Shaley, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Okay, does that work? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, and hi everyone. I'm excited for this talk. I've watched these seminars for all all summer and this semester, and so it's cool to be able to give a talk here myself. Um, so, um, like Liz said, my name is Shaylee, and um, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my work with a long-term data set of superb starlings, which are these beautiful birds um, that are cooperative breeders that form mixed-skin social groups, and I'm going to be talking about alternative, alternative reproductive tactics in the males in this species. Okay, so a little bit of background. Um, in cooperatively breeding species, one or more non-parental helpers help care for our offspring alongside the parents. And these species often form social groups, which are thought to mainly comprise of kin uh, who are delaying or foregoing dispersal, which here are an orange and I'm calling them residents. And according to the theory of kin selection, this behavior is adaptive since residents can accrue indirect benefits by helping raise offspring that they're closely related to. And so this behavior is adaptive. Oh, how do I advance slides? Sorry. Um, okay. But, um, like uh, eventually the, some of these residents may also accrue direct benefits by uh, acquiring reproductive opportunities in their natal groups. And um, so they might also acquire direct benefits in their natal groups. However, some social groups also contain unrelated immigrants and often these immigrants are also acting as helpers in these groups. So the question um, is that for such mixed skin social groups to be adaptive, these immigrants must be getting some sort of direct benefit from being part of the social group since they can't get indirect benefits from cooperating with kin in these groups because they don't have kin in the group, um, at least not to begin with. So we know that many vertebrates live in such mixed kin cooperative groups. Uh, in fact, 23% of all cooperatively breeding birds form mixed kin social groups. And so this suggests that kin selection can't be the sole driver of cooperative behavior. And the question then is what are the other selective pressures that are driving the formation of such mixed kin cooperative groups? So to answer this question, we use data from a long-term data set of superb starlings. Uh, this data follows nine social groups over 31 breeding seasons at Impala Research Center, which is in central Kenya. Um, and that's the map is the boundary of the research center. And Impala spans 20 kilometers from north to south. And the locations of the nine groups are plotted on that map in red. And this is a long-term project, which was established in 2001 by Dustin, who's going to be talking right after me. And um, a series of field assistants and students and postdocs have worked on this project in some capacity in the past 19 years. So this data is definitely a group effort. Uh, and a lot of credit goes to the field assistants who work on this project year round. So super starlings are obligate plural cooperatively breeding birds. 
Um, and this means that they form social groups with more than one breeding pair and multiple non-breeding helpers in these social groups. And these social groups comprise of both residents and immigrants, so they are mixed skin groups. And both sexes can disperse or remain in the natal group uh, in, in the species. Um, Superb starlings are found on the African savanna, which is an unpredictable environment, which can have very wet years, very dry years, uh, some years in between, and uh, it is unpredictable from year to year what kind of year it's going to be. And the starlings are shaped by this environmental variability, and they're shaped not just by the conditions that they experience in their lifetime, but also by prenatal conditions that are experienced by their parents uh, before the offspring are born. So there is evidence of prenatal parental effects in this species. So of particular interest in my study are the males in these social groups. Um, interestingly, both immigrant and residents act as helpers in these social groups, despite immigrants having no kin in these social groups to begin with. And for males, both immigrant and residents can breed. Um, interestingly, for females, only immigrant females breed, but for males, both of the both, both dispersal tactics can lead to some sort of um, reproductive um, benefit for these for the males. So this does suggest that both dispersing and not dispersing are viable alternative routes to occurring fitness for the males in the species. And so to understand why these mixed skin groups form and are adaptive, we must ask the following four questions. Um, first, are those two tactics uh, equal? Do they have equal fitness outcomes? Second, do they have some reproductive trade-offs that makes both of them, um, ma makes both of the tactics persist in a variable environment? Third, why would a male decide to disperse versus not? Like what aspects of their environment governs their decision to disperse versus the, the natal group? And lastly, if a male adopts a tactic that is mismatched to its environment, um, based on what environmental uh, factors govern their decision to disperse or not, if the male adopts a mismatched tactic, does it result in lower lifetime fitness for that individual? Okay, so tackling these questions one at a time. Uh, first, we looked at fitness outcomes of the two tactics. And we predicted that if one tactic was the best of a bad job tactic, uh, the individuals adopting it would have significantly lower fitness than the individuals adopting the alternative tactic. Conversely, if the two tactics um, were equal, they would have equal fitness outcomes. And we did find when we quantified and compared the lifetime fitness of all the males for whom we had complete life histories that immigrant and resident males have equal lifetime inclusive fitness. Um, Next. Okay. Um, and interestingly, both components of inclusive fitness, so direct fitness, which is accrued by direct reproduction, and indirect fitness, which is accrued by helping raise uh, offspring, were equal for immigrant and resident males. And this was surprising because residents on the whole are more related to individuals in their social group than immigrants, yet they did not have significantly higher indirect fitness than the, um, immigrant males. So now that we know that both of these tactics are equal, why do they both persist? If they have equal fitness outcomes, are there any reproductive trade-offs that make both of these tactics equally adaptive and thus able to persist in a variable, unpredictable environment? Um, so we investigated the, pre for, uh, the presence of these reproductive trade-offs, and we looked at um, two aspects of reproductive success. We looked at breeding effort, which is the number of breeding attempts that a male has in its, in its adult lifetime. And we looked at nest success, which is the likelihood of a male successfully fledging offspring from its nest. And so, as you predicted, we did find a reproductive trade-off between the two dispersal tactics. So we found that while immigrants were able to put in more breeding effort over their lifetime, the residents that did breed had higher nest success than the immigrants. And so we further examined the relationship between breeding effort, bred status, and inclusive fitness. Um, so here on this graph, on the x-axis is breeding effort. On the y-axis is probability of accruing inclusive fitness. So zero is no fitness in your lifetime and one is some inclusive fitness in their lifetime. And we found that immigrants and residents were both equally likely to accrue some inclusive fitness with increased breeding efforts. So here, birth status did not have an effect on likelihood of accruing inclusive fitness. However, when we look at the subset of individuals that acquired some non-zero inclusive fitness and plot inclusive fitness as a continuous variable um, in relation to breeding effort, we find that residents do accrue higher inclusive fitness than immigrants with the same amount of breeding effort. So kind of circling back to that trade-off I talked about earlier, uh, this suggests that immigrants have higher quantity of reproduction, so they can put in higher breeding effort, while residents adopt a tactic of higher reproductive quality. So they have higher nest success than immigrants. So basically they can afford 
to put in less breeding effort over their lifetime and still do just as well as immigrants because they have that higher nest success that makes these two tactics uh, level out and equal. So that was interesting. Um, but then the question is, if both of these tactics have these reproductive trade-offs and are, have equal fitness outcomes, why do one versus the other? So what are the, the factors that are governing whether a male disperses or not? And so to, do, to look at this, uh, we looked at the following factors and um, we looked at both prenatal and postnatal ecological um, as well as postnatal social factors. Um, and we predicted that dispersal will decrease um, or sorry, dispersal will increase with increasing rainfall because when rainfall is higher, there's more food available, there are more, there are more grubs available for, for food. And so the individuals might be in better condition. And we also predicted that dispersal will decrease with increasing group size because we know their fitness increases with increasing group size in the species. And we predicted that with a higher sex ratio in the group, so when there's an excess of males in the group, uh, individuals will be more likely to disperse because there will be more, more males as opposed to females, so they'll be less likely to accrue uh, breeding opportunities in their group and will thus disperse out. Okay, so a quick explanation of the prenatal parental effects and why we were looking at them. Um, so parents have been shown to affect the phenotype of offspring through hormones or epigenetic modifications prior to the birth of the offspring. Um, and in birds in particular, hormone deposition in eggs has been shown to affect offspring, offspring dispersal in a couple of species, uh, I think great tits and bluebirds. Um, and so in cooperative breeders in particular, this, is, uh, this effect might be particularly pronounced because the parents actually have a direct stake in their offspring delaying dispersal, right? So in a bad year, the parents might, be more, might want their offspring to stay in their natal group so that they can accrue more helpers at their future nests and so get more help and get through a bad spell. Um, and in a good year, they might be um, programming their offspring to disperse so that they can limit kin competition within the social groups. And both of these um, uh, parental effects can also can, can be selfish, like I just described, but they can also be anticipatory and also increase the fitness of the offspring themselves. And indeed, as I showed before, the two um, tactics do have equal fitness outcomes. So it does seem like uh, these effects, if they do exist, prenatal parental effects are anticipatory as, as well as selfish. And we found that indeed male dispersal was governed by prenatal factors. So males were more likely to disperse when born following periods of higher prenatal rainfall. And in fact, none of the postnatal ecological and social factors that we looked at that I mentioned before had any effect on the dispersal of males in the species. Um, and lastly, we predicted that if dispersal is based on these prenatal environmental conditions that we just found, uh, does uh, adopting a mismatch tactic should lead to lower lifetime fitness. Um, and quickly, um, indeed, that is what we found. So when I looked at likelihood of accruing uh, inclusive fitness, which is on the y-axis in relation to prenatal rainfall, uh, I found that when males adopt a mismatch tactic in relation to the prenatal environment that their parents experience, they have a marginally lower likelihood of accruing some lifetime inclusive fitness. So what does this all mean? Uh, in summary, uh, first we found that dispersal decisions in superb starling males seem to be determined by prenatal parental effects. Um, and as I said before, in cooperatively breeding species, this is particularly interesting because limiting dispersal of offspring can directly impact the future reproductive success of the parents. So this is something that should be looked into more. Um, and as we saw, these two dispersal tactics result in equal lifetime fitness for the offspring too. And so this would explain why both of these tactics persist, leading to the formation of these stable mixed skin social groups. And finally, the two alternative dispersal uh, tactics have reproductive and fitness trade-offs. And so they seem to be both maintained in an unpredictable environment because of these trade-offs. And so on the whole, our results suggest that limited dispersal of kin is in the only way for cooperative social groups to form. Um, and that selective pressures other than kin selection can lead to the evolution uh, of such stable social groups. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone who made the study possible and I will take any questions, though I might be at 15 minutes. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was really great. We already have um, some questions coming in. So first, uh, Alva Strand asks, how often do individuals change strategies? That is, how often do residents become immigrants and immigrants become residents? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, what we think happens in these, in, uh, in the superb starlings is that the um, 
individuals decide, at, at least males decide at around one year old, whether they're going to disperse or not. And then once they join a social group and start breeding there, they don't really uh, change their social groups. So of the nine social groups that have been monitored for 13 years, um, or sorry, 19 years, um, we haven't seen any individuals um, change their social groups once they have like either decided to stay after they're a year old or join that social group as an immigrant. Cool, so that suggests that there's not really a heritable component to being a disperser versus being a resident? Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, that's that's like, that's the really interesting question. And if I'm, you know, kind of thinking of like, is there like oscillating selection in the system that you would want, you would think that there would be a genetic component. Um, I don't know. Um, and I, there's something that, definitely needs to be looked into. Um, yeah, can I just say, I don't know, I'm not sure. But yeah, it'd be no. really cool if there were, yeah. That can be a hard question to answer sometimes, so yeah, cool. Uh, okay, Mark Hauber asks, is there a role for RAIN on predation in these systems um, or maternal programming due to predation? Yeah, oh, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, again, I don't know. Um, Dustin might know, um, but yeah, it's, predation seems to be, fairly stochastic as far as I know. And it's very, very high at all times, like 90% of the nests get predated. Um, I don't know if it's it differs in it, based on rainfall, but it would be interesting to look at. Yeah, for sure. OK, great. So I think we'll switch over now. Thank you so much, Shaylee. Yeah, um, let me stop. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Okay, so now I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Justin Rubenstein, who is an associate professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology at Columbia. His research takes an integrative approach to understand why complex animal societies form and how organisms cope with environmental change. And what I find really exciting about his research is how he combines behavior, ecology, and evolution with uh, techniques of to understand the underlying molecular and neuroendocrine mechanisms to understand these biological questions in a variety of species all over the world. And so I'm really thrilled to welcome Dustin today to hear about environmental uncertainty and the evolution of sociality in starlings. So Dustin, take it away. Oh, and he left. My, my guess is that Dustin will be back any moment now. Uh, Shaylee, let me ask you a question while we wait for Dustin to get back, because um, is there, is there conflicting interests between the the offspring and the and the parents in terms of whether or not they disperse? Because I mean, you refer to it as programming, and I'm wondering how much of that is programming for the parents' sake and versus programming for the offspring's sake. Yeah, yeah, and that that's the part that I find most fascinating. Um, I it seems like they are both aligned because the the parents gain more helpers, but it does seem like if the males are staying in their social group uh, when you know, following harsh prenatal conditions, they do seem to do better when they adopt that strategy. So in th those two view those two um, interests might be aligned and there might not be conflict, um, but that's like a, a fairly coarse way of looking at, like I haven't, you know, looked at that in detail. So it'd be, that would be really interesting to figure out. And that's why cooperative breeders are so interesting. Great, thanks Shaylee. Dustin, all right, can you hear us again? All right, sorry. My, no uh, Take it away when you're ready. Great, my uh, computer crashed, but now I'm back. All right. All right, can we see that? Yes. All right, thanks, good, we're back on. Thank you for uh, inviting me and for Shaley for doing a perfect introduction so I can skip over a lot of the details of the study system. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a broader perspective on, um, on, uh, on this long-term research and I'll talk about the role of environmental uncertainty um, in a couple of contexts. And, and one way to think of this too is maybe lessons from a long-term animal research study in an unpredictable environment, which makes uh, doing the research uh, challenging and from year to year to some degree. So I'm gonna talk for the most part about starlings today, but uh, as you mentioned, I work on a number of other systems um, 
a lot of other avian systems, some for long term. So we've been working on snapping shrimp for over 15 years at this point and burying beetles for about a decade. Um, and I have a number of students and postdocs that have worked on various things. And I think the introduction to the starlings actually came from some work that I started right after college on marine iguanas in the Galapagos Islands. And this is me about half a lifetime ago, 20, 21, 22 years ago, spending a lot of time, many hours a day, many weeks uh, for many months, um, watching these, this species, marine iguanas, um, watching their mating behavior, their social behavior, and their foraging ecology. And that really introduced me um, into a lot of uh, a lot of what I do now in terms of field work, but it also gave me the opportunity to not just watch these animals, but while I was waiting for the breeding season to start, I spent a lot of time watching these birds, Galapagos mockingbirds, which are plural breeders, a lot like the superb starling. Um, I didn't have access to internet. I didn't have access to literature to read up on them. I just got to watch them for many months. Um, and that was very important because it shaped a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today and what I've done subsequently. And I think that's really the first maybe lesson from long-term animal research, watch your animals. And that's a lesson that I learned probably in my first or second month of graduate school when my co-advisor, Paul Sherman, I think many people listening know Paul, and you can imagine him shaking his finger saying, now Dustin, don't worry about the question, just go pick an animal and go watch it for a few months and you'll come up with plenty of questions. And I think to some degree that's true. I think you wanna enter a, a study with, some, you know, with the theory and the questions in mind, but that idea of watching your animals in long-term research is something I learned from Paul and really from all of my uh, mentors who, who have done long-term animal research in mammals um, or birds. And maybe as a side lesson, you should uh, listen to your mentors because they they have a lot of experience in these areas and, and they can um, help prevent a lot of problems as you start these type of projects. So I went into graduate school thinking I was going to work on these organisms. So I went to Cornell to work with Steve Emlin primarily because he had worked on bee eaters and these are Carmine's bee eaters from Southern Africa and I had spent some time in Southern Africa before, before grad school um, and I was interested in their, in their social system. Um, but for a variety of reasons I didn't end up there. I ended up where Shaley mentioned at the Impala Research Center uh, in central Kenya. And I think that was fortuitous for a number of reasons. Um, it's right on the equator, um, uh, which makes some of the stuff about environmental variability I'm talking about important. Um, but it also, it also helped logistically. Working in the Galapagos was challenging, living on a desert island without access to food or water or communication. Um, but working in Impala in as many ways, much more civilized. It's certainly more civilized today than it was 20 years ago. Um, but maybe that's the other lesson. When you think about setting up a long-term field system, field logistics matter, right? I look at a lot of my colleagues working in Kenya who have to set up their own long-term camps or buy their houses and deal with all of that. And we luckily don't have to deal with that. We can base out of a field station and have good infrastructure, uh, good access to mechanics. This is one of my vehicles that's gone all over Kenya. Uh, the head has blown three times and often in some precarious positions, um, but it's nice to be able to call home and, and, and get a mechanic and, and get a ride back at night sometimes. So as Shaley mentioned, we started this project almost 20 years ago. We're coming up on the 20th anniversary. Um, and it was, it was very clear that sharing, that, that within one or two breeding seasons, um, everything that goes on in the system has to do with the variability in the rainfall. Okay, so the amount of rainfall that falls from year to year, when the rains start, and when they stop. Okay, and if we think about the phenotypes, the social phenotypes that Shaley mentioned, if we think about a lot of the life history decisions and the physiology that I'll talk about, really most of it is driven by um, the amount of rainfall variation that we see between years and to some degree within years. And I think as a behavioral ecologist interested in understanding the relationship between phenotype and fitness, and again, Shaley illustrated that perfectly in her talk, it's the environment that mediates a lot of these interactions. And so the first part of the talk, I'm gonna focus on, on this side of the diagram, looking at the relationship between environment, phenotype, and fitness. And then for the second half of the talk, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and think about genotype to phenotype matching, something that I think behavioral ecologists and biologists generally are becoming more and more interested in as we get more genomic tools. But again, thinking about the way that the environment uh, mediates this relationship. And I would argue that if we really un understand the link between genotype and phenotype, we can really only do that by thinking about fitness. And all three of these 
links in the chain are going to be influenced, particularly in this system, by the uh, environment and the environmental uncertainty that the birds are experiencing. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk briefly about the environmental drivers of social complexity, and then I'll end by uh, introducing some of where we're going by thinking about the mechanisms of social plasticity, um, some of the sort of the black box area that Shaley didn't quite touch on in her talk. So, and in the back of your mind, I want you to think about this idea of integration and why it can be useful for studying animal behavior and why it can be particularly useful for studying uh, long-term studies of animal research. Now, integration allows us to, to do new things. It allows us to test um, classic questions uh, in new ways um, and really explore the robustness of current paradigms. And we call this paradigm sort of reinforcing but perhaps the gold standard is what, what we call sort of paradigm shifting. And this is changing the way that scientists view a problem by generating novel hypotheses or developing new paradigms. And I think this is what we all sort of can and should strive for. Um, and hopefully I'll illustrate some ways where we can get there by building off of the long-term data sets in, in, in new and exciting ways today. So we begin that integration, I think, where, where most of us start with Tinbergian levels of analysis, right? And I shall talk a little bit about, a lot about the functional aspects of this. I'll begin by illustrating some of the comparative evolutionary um, aspects, thinking about how comparative methods can generate hypotheses that we can test in the field. And then I'll end by talking a little bit about some of the proximate mechanisms, both the mechanisms, hormonal and genetic, and then a little bit about development. This is a picture of, uh, uh, of melanosomes and starling feathers. And we've been thinking very recently about the evolution of iridescence in starlings and other species. I won't get into that too much, but we do really think about all four aspects of this. But being integrative is not just thinking about one at different times, but trying to integrate these levels together as we design our projects. And then even moving beyond levels of analysis, right? It starts there, I think. But we can think about different scales of biolog biological organization, going all the way from molecules up to populations or species distributions, thinking at different temporal and spatial scales, following populations through time, or studying different populations along environmental gradients, and then doing this in a diversity of taxonomic groups, right? In my lab, we work on everything from crustaceans to mammals to birds. And then, of course, answering those questions using a variety of these new cutting edge and tools and techniques. And so hopefully I'll be able to illustrate this a bit today. So I want to start by thinking, um, as Shaley alluded to, how the environment influences social complexity in starlings and other animals. And so probably everybody listening today is well aware of the, of the impact of climate change and an increase in, in mean temperature in many places across the globe. But along with that increase in, in temperature, comes an increase in the variation. So increase in extreme weather events like storms, hurricanes, fires, really all the things that we're experiencing in North America right now are increasing in intensity and in frequency as a result of, of climate change. And I would argue that if we wanna understand how organisms are going to respond to this increasingly changing climate, we first have to understand how they've evolved to cope with environmental uncertainty. And so we can look in organisms that have for many, many generations lived and experienced these types of environments and learn how they cope and how they deal with these environments to then be able to predict back how organisms in other places might respond to anthropogenic climate change. And so this was sort of in the back of the mind, in my mind when I started on the superb starlings because of that time in the Galapagos, an area that experiences El Nino events more frequently than anywhere else in the world. Um, and really from the outset of this project, even as we began the empirical work, we started this comparative approach, thinking broadly about African starlings uh, across Africa and indeed across the world. There's about 45 species in Africa and they exhibit a whole range of social behaviors from plural cooperative breeding to more simple singular cooperative breeding and non-cooperative breeding. There's gregarious species and less gregarious species. And so we were interested in the role in the relationship between uh, cooperative breeding behavior and, and habitat and climate. And if you look at the distribution of cooperative breeding starlings, you find that they occur overwhelmingly in the savanna environments and the non-cooperative species tend to occur in the non-savanna environments. And that's basically because of the, 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 the type of uh, variability in rainfall that they experience. And I won't get into too many of the details other than to say that the degree of temporal stability um, in, in, the, in the rainfall variability sort of 
best predicts the distribution of cooperative and non-cooperative starlings. Okay, so the cooperative breeders tend to be found in the more um, unstable, temporally variable environments than the non-cooperative breeders. And so this study was initially based, you know, just on 45 species. And we wanted to expand out to see if this rule um, held more broadly across birds. And so we looked at basically all of the terrestrial birds on earth uh, using a similar approach. And if you look at the distribution of cooperative breeding birds, you find them uh, in specific areas in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and things like that. And the best environmental predictor of the distribution of these birds was the among year variation in precipitation. And a little bit later, we used a different approach, looking at temperature and precipitation combined to get an environmental harshness predictor. Um, and we saw the same basic pattern, right? So the cooperative breeders tend to be found in the more harsh environments. And this pattern holds not just in birds, but we see it in mammals. Here's some recent work we did in Australian rodents, again, so the social rodents occur. Um, here, the, it's, uh, the harshness variable is a little bit different. So the, the but the social species tend to be found in the more environmentally harsh environments, again, with um, temperature and precipitation combined. And Dieter Lucas and Tim Kluttenbrock have shown, so similarly across all mammals, we see the same sort of pattern. Just in the last month or two, the same type of analysis has been done in humans, looking at traditional human societies. And again, environmental harshness promotes alloparental care in traditional human societies. There's also some evidence from Mike Sheehan and wasps and Sarah Kocher and bees. And so this tends to, this pattern we see, one of basically a relationship between environmental variability and social behavior is widespread across animals. And it's something that, that we can learn about from this comparative, these all comparative analyses. The problem though, is the comparative analyses don't really tell us why these species are found in these types of environments. They just really give us the pattern. Okay, so we can generate a pattern between environment and phenotype, social behavior in this case, but if we really understand why, we need to think about the fitness consequences of animals that adopt these behaviors in these specific types of environments. And for that, we need to go into the field and use our long-term studies of in marked individuals that we can follow for a lifetime. Okay, and so Shaley introduced the study, study system well, but I'll just make the point that this is a very unpredictable environment. So here's one of our um, study sites and this picture is taken in different years, but basically at the same time of year, only a few days to weeks apart. So there's a pronounced dry season and a pronounced wet season, but when the rains come and how long they last varies from year to year. So we call this a temporally variable, but unpredictable environment. And what drives this is the monsoon rains. So this is just a snapshot animated of mean monthly rainfall. And you can see that as the monsoons move north above the equator and south, they bring the rains. And so to some degree, there is some predictability in the system because the monsoon rains, you know, for the most part occur each year. It's just when they occur and how long they last that varies. And so if you look at the long-term rainfall patterns at the study site, you can see that there's two peaks of rainfall what we call a long rains breeding season and a short rains breeding season. And then in between these two breeding seasons, there are two pronounced dry seasons where there's not a lot of rainfall. And if you plot the variation in rainfall for each month, you should get a negative relationship like this. But the point I wanna make is that the most variable months are also the driest months. And those are those periods in December, January, and February, the period before the primary breeding season, which typically starts uh, in March or April. And that period um, uh, the, the amount of rainfall that falls in that period and the variation that we see across years predicts most of the behavior, life history, and physiology in the species, okay? So if you look at something like the number of first-time breeders or the proportion of first-time breeders in the group or the amount of help that helpers give relative to breeders, it's influenced by the amount of rain in that period. A number of life history traits. This is looking at the sex ratio of the offspring laid. Um, it also, it also affects the size of the eggs that are laid and things like this. And then of course, physiology. This is looking at immune function, just a bacterial killing assay, which is much less pronounced in birds when they're from a dry year. We can look at glucocorticoid hormones and see many of the same patterns. So most of, I'd say, of the behavior, physiology, and life history is influenced by the variation that falls in that critical window prior to the primary breeding season and to some degree, the variation before the second breeding season as well.
So whatever you throw at it, we tend to find significant relationships, except when we looked at reproductive success, probably the most important metric, right? And so this puzzled me for a long time. If you look at among year variation in rainfall, this is breeding rainfall, but you could look at pre-breeding rainfall and you, and you quantify fitness in a variety of different, reproductive success in a variety of different ways. This is mean per the group. There was no relationship. Okay, and so why were we looking at mean fitness? Well, that's what that's what behavioral ecologists do, and that's what people that study social behavior do. And you know, there's a long, rich theoretical tradition of that. This is some work by you know Walt Koenig looking at you know the the fitness consequences of different strategies, breeding, delaying dispersal, or floating. And you can look at the you know the relative fitness differences to predict when individuals should do one thing or the other. At the same time, people were looking at this idea of ecological constraints that might influence what behavior an individual would do. There was this, there was this other idea, the benefits of Philippatry hypothesis, which I think now most people would say, you know, is quote, two sides of the same coin. But if you look at how these ideas were, were, were originally developed, they were quite different. Ecological constraints was looking at the mean fitness of different behavioral strategies and how that might promote non-dispersing versus dispersing, some of the things that Shaley talked about. But the benefits of Philippatry was really a reproductive variance idea. Okay, so the, the, the original paper uh, looked at three species, the acorn woodpecker, the green wood hoopoe, and the mountain chickadee. The acorn woodpecker is a cooperative breeder in the Pacific West and Southwest, the green wood hoopoe in, in East and Southern Africa, and the mountain chickadee is a non-cooperative breeder uh, in the Northeast and Central all the way up through Canada. And if you just look at the variance in, 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 in young produced, so fecundity variance uh, across territory, territories, it's much higher in the cooperative breeders than it is in the non-cooperative breeders. And that was the idea that led to this idea of benefits of philopatry, that the reason um, birds form cooperative social groups is for the benefits they receive from staying home rather than the costs of dispersing, okay? But when you start to think about a reproductive variance idea, you should think about um, the idea of bed hedging. Now we're most familiar with the, with the, with the what's called diversified bed hedging. These are strategies to take advantage of alternative environmental scenarios. So this is no different than you investing your, um, your, your you, in, in multiple stocks or putting it in a mutual fund rather than investing it all in say Google like this, right? But there's another type of bed hedging and that's called conservative bed hedging. And these are strategies to minimize fecundity variance across environmental conditions. And basically all that means is you want to prevent complete failures. You want years where, where you don't get complete reproductive failure. So you're minimizing the zeros in your reproductive success data set. Um, and Gillespie and others have argued that when populations are small, perhaps subdivided, as you see in cooperative breeders, variance in fecundity can influence fitness as much as mean fecundity, okay? And it gets into these ideas of geometric versus arithmetic um, fitness. But the point is that in small subdivided populations, like we see in many social species, variance may be as or maybe even more important than the mean. And so to test that idea of conservative bed hedging, we used what was then a long-term data set of, you know, maybe only seven or eight years. We now have probably double that. Um, and looked at the relation, tested a few predictions that I came up with for this idea. I'm just going to show you one graph. And this is looking at the, the standardized variance, so the variance standardized around the mean uh, in relation to breeding rainfall. Um, and so there's a, there's a this significant negative relationship such that among year variation, sorry, uh, variation in reproductive success is higher in, in drier years and it's reduced in wetter years. And, and, and this and some of the other things in that paper um, sort of became formulated as the what we call the bed hedging hypothesis. And the idea is basically that cooperative breeding, meaning living in these large social groups and having helpers, reduces environmentally induced fecundity variance. Okay. And subsequently, there's been support for this idea from a number of species, including acorn woodpeckers, um, pied babblers, and others. And I think what's really interesting is that a few years after this, uh, Patrick Kennedy sort of took this idea of environmental variation and sort of blended it with Hamilton's rule and kin selection theory and mathematically put this idea into it. And he came up with a much better uh, name for it, altruistic bed hedging. Um, and so this really gives us now a theoretical framework to think about the role of environmental variation in sort of cooperative behavior and the evolution of, of societies. Um, I don't think this idea has really been tested that much, but I'm excited because Patrick is, is, is joining my lab in January 
to test some of these ideas uh, in wasps across a huge ecological gradient in Africa. So it'll be interesting to see again if these same ideas hold when you move from uh, birds and mammals uh, back into insects. And so social groups of superb starlings and perhaps other birds help reduce reproductive variance across years, but does breeding cooperatively, what I mean having helpers and living in large groups actually influence fitness, right? That's what really matters at the end of the day. And this was part of my former student, Sarah Gindra Parker's PhD work. And I'll just, I'll just give some examples really quickly. So superb starlings are not the only starling that live at this site. In fact, two other species in the genus that are very closely related live syntopically, meaning they often nest um, and, and the same territories. They have relatively similar diets. So they have diff some different life history strategies like cavity versus open cup nesting. Um, but the other two are basically non-social. The greater blue eared glossy on the, on the bottom here is a, is a non-cooperative species and the Hildebrand starling on the top left um, is basically facultatively cooperative occasionally. Every now and then there's a single helper at the nest of a very small proportion of the birds in the group. And so what we knew early on was that the cooperative of the breeding starling, the superb starling, breeds for nearly twice as long as these non-social species. And that's because they're able to lay many, many more nests per season. And they're better able to take advantage of the environmental conditions. So they breed during both that long and short range breeding period. The only time, this is some older data, but the Hildebrands and the Blue Glossies have now bred twice in, in, in 20 years during, during these short range. Um, and both times were during uh, El Nino events where it basically rained the entire time. Okay, so there's, so there's significant life history difference between these species, which suggests that the cooperative breeders are able to breed for longer and perhaps breed more than the non-cooperative species. This is potentially costly. And so the first thing that Sarah did was look at the cost of reproduction between two of these species. In the cooperative superb starling, she measured the oxidative cost of reproduction from incubation to chick rearing. You'd expect to see an increase in these lines if rearing the young is costly. The points are just different sexes and different breeding roles, not important for now. But what you see is that there's no increase in the oxidative cost as you move from the incubation period to the chick rearing period. But if you look in the non-cooperative species, the blue-red glossy, you see for both the mothers and the fathers, there is a, a cost of raising those young. Okay, so the first thing that we can say is, is, is cooperative breeding might actually reduce the cost of reproduction which are likely to be high in these types of environments because predation is very high as Shaley, uh, I think was talking about when my uh, computer crashed. Um, and, and also because the breeding seasons can be so long. And so having helpers at the nest might reduce those costs. And then she went in to sort of the long-term study and helped collect a lot of these data for a number of years and looked at the reproductive benefits first and found that having more helpers uh, leads to uh, increase in the number of offspring you fledge. And that's primarily because it reduces predation. Predation is the primary driver of reproductive failure in the system. Starvation is important at the beginning of this breeding season, at the end of the breeding season, but predation is pretty intense. And she looked not only at the reproductive benefits, she also looked at the survival benefits. So here's just a graph, sort of a, a survival analysis looking at how well, how long birds live if they live in a group of average size, which is about 20 to 25 individuals, or an above average size or below average size. And if you live in a large group, you tend to live longer. We don't know why this is yet. We have some hypotheses. Um, but basically what this suggests is that, you know, it pays to live in bigger and bigger groups, which is kind of interesting. Now, what's the role of environment in all this? It's a complicated story because the environment definitely mediates it, but it does so differently in the different sexes and the different breeding roles and differently for the reproductive benefits and the survival benefits. So I'm not gonna go into that other than saying that it's not a clean story about the role of the environment. Sometimes birds do better in good years, sometimes they do better in bad years, but the environmental variation definitely uh, has an important role in these both reproductive and survival benefits. Okay, so this comparative analysis gave us a, a really, I think a hypothesis to test really a relationship between environmental variability and social behavior. And then our functional analysis um, really allows us to get in there and look at the different components of fitness and think about the costs and the benefits of being cooperative, both being a helper or having helpers and living in groups of large size. And then thinking about the, the, the role that the environment plays in, in mediating. So that's sort of lesson number three. I think comparative methods are, are really helpful for any study, 
Um, and uh, they're particularly helpful uh, to get in a nice fancy publication sometimes, but they allow us to generate hypotheses that we can go back and test empirically. And I think field work is critical in that and long term field studies give us the database that allows us to test some of these ideas. And I think again, Shaley illustrated that really well. Okay, so now I wanna shift gears to the last 20 minutes or so and think about the mechanisms of all of this. And, and we'll call them say the mechanisms of social plasticity. Hopefully I've convinced you that, that the environment mediates this phenotype to fitness relationship. But when we wanna look at the genotype to phenotype, we don't really know where to start and what the mechanisms are. Um, a good place to start, I think, is thinking about the social structure of the group, which, which we heard about uh, in a little bit more detail, or detail previously. The superb starlings are plural cooperative breeders. They live in large groups, mixed kin groups with lots of breeding roles, right? Basically these plural groups um, are a combination of multiple family units, breeding pairs with helpers that are typically offspring, but not always as you heard, uh, helping to raise their parents, but there can be multiple um, family groups within the plural breeding group and helpers can help at multiple nests. A lot of the breeders, uh, the males, as Shaley mentioned, are unrelated to the, their non-natal males. They immigrate in and they begin breeding in the group, which is a bit of a puzzle given everything we know about kin selection. And so I won't go into too much detail because Shaley really talked about this, but just highlighting two of her key results, I think. These immigrant and resident males have equal lifetime inclusive fitness, right? So they seem to be two different strategies um, with equal, equal fitness benefits. And her main point by showing that the probability of dispersing was related to the amount of rainfall that the parents experienced prior to birth was that dispersal is determined by prenatal environmental conditions, not by postnatal ecological or social conditions. And that's going to be a bit important to what I think about. So how does this prenatal parental environment influence offspring phenotype and ultimately fitness? And Shaley sort of gave you a slide thinking about hormones and epigenetic factors as two potential ways to do that. But I think if you step back, this is a question about adaptive plasticity. And so, you know, the, the classic definition of phenotypic plasticity is the ability of one genotype to produce more than one phenotype when exposed to different environments, okay? And we, and we take a classic reaction norm approach where the environment might vary, um, but the phenotype might not differ. So we can attribute it all to sort of genetic variation, or we can sometimes attribute everything to environmental variation. Or I think the more interesting scenario, at least the way I think about it, is that there might be a gene by environment interaction and different genotypes are doing different things um, across environments. But we can reframe the phenotypic plasticity definition slightly which might help in our thinking. And this is by, by describing it as the adjustment of genotypic expression during development, which can be either irreversible um, or throughout the lifetime, which can be reversible, okay? And so here's just some data from Drosophila, uh, basically looking at different, uh, uh, different, the expression of different genes and different categories as you change temperature, okay? Some saw this negative increase and some saw this positive increase. And of course, most, which I'm not showing you, show no change as you, as you change the temperature. And so we can put it in this reaction norm approach and think about gene expression on the Y as a function of, of different, different temperatures and get this G by E interaction and think about different genes that might lead to these phenotypic or these gene expression responses. Um, and so, what I'm interested in is trying to identify what I think of as environmentally sensitive genes or sometimes have been called plasticity genes by uh, Pigliucci and others. And these are regulatory loci that exert environmentally dependent control over gene expression and produce plastic responses in say behavior, right? And you know, we know from some, some conceptual and theoretical work that, that the, these genes tend to have distinct promoter architectures with many regulatory elements and these elements tend to be, you know, much upstream of the genes that we're working on. So this gives us some, you know, some hypotheses about where to look and what to look at. And so how then do organisms integrate environmental inter information and adjust their phenotype or adjust their behavior? And Shaley introduced this idea with like a much more elegant slide, but, you know, the two that I think about the most are hormones, particularly steroid hormones. They're, way, they're a mechanism that allow an organism to immediately take information from an environment, say a change in ecology or a change in the social environment and change its behavior and change its physiology. 
Okay, so we've thought a lot about steroid hormones like corticosterone. But another thing that we've been thinking about more recently are epigenetic modification. Changes to the DNA, not the base pairs, but changes to the way the DNA is packed, the way that, 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 that allows it to be accessed, um, and, or chemical modifications that, that impact its expression as well. And so here's the, the way that I think about this, I guess. Early life environments, as Shaley indicated, can influence phenotype, which can affect the phenotype in adulthood and ultimately lead to differences or changes in fitness. Okay. Now, we don't really know, do all or any of those changes in, in early life persist into adulthood, but it's one area it's important to look at. And then we also don't know too much about how the, the sort of the, the later life environment, the adult environment interacts with the phenotype that changes anymore. There's more and more studies coming out on this. There's a nice study I have not a chance to read yet from the Ambicelli Baboon Project, basically looking at this idea that came out, I think, last week or this week. Um, but these are some open-ended questions that I think are important to address. And we have a framework for thinking about this, I would argue. And this is the organizational activational hypothesis of steroid hormones, right? So the same steroid hormones can program the nervous system early in development, and they can also modulate behaviors later in development. And it may be that the same type of paradigm could work at the level of the genome. And so there could be um, early um, organization um, of phenotypes using some epigenetic methods, like say epigenetic modifications like DNA methylation. And those could also change throughout the life of an organism and be influenced by conditions later in life. And so how these two things interact is gonna be important. I'm only gonna really talk about the left side of the equation uh, today. And the, and the framework that I'm thinking about is, is, is basically that DNA methylation in the regulatory regions of the promoter can suppress gene expression downstream. So the idea is if you have an, an unmethylated uh, promoter region, the gene might express normally, but if you have these chemical modifications, these, these methyl groups added to uh, CG adjacents or CPG sites, that might lead to repressed uh, gene expression downstream. And so that's the paradigm that, that we've been thinking about. Um, and when we think about this idea, the hypothesis that, that most often comes to mind is the predictive adaptive response, the PAR hypothesis, or sometimes thought of as the environmental matching of phenotypes. And the idea is pretty simple. If the early environment and the postnatal or adult environment match, then a predictive adaptive, a predictive adaptive response will be advantageous later in life. So that's just indicated, indicated by the colors here. Right? If the colors match, the organism is happy later in life even if it experienced poor conditions early in life. But if it's mismatched, then it will not be adaptive and it will be unhappy, right? And there's lots of good evidence supporting this hypothesis, but I'd argue that most of that comes from the temperate or the Arctic regions or species that have some predictability in their environments. You know, so the early life, the early life environment is likely to be predictive of the later life environment because of the type of climate they experience. But when we're talking about semi-arid adapted organisms that live on the equator, I'm not sure this, this, this hypothesis makes much sense because you're gonna experience a whole range of in conditions in adulthood that some are gonna match and some are gonna mismatch from early life. And so there's really two other hypotheses. One is that what we're calling the developmental constraint hypothesis and the idea that individuals born in low quality environments are gonna experience reduced fitness later in life, no matter what. So the, the environment they experience, they're gonna be unhappy here. Alternatively, perhaps individuals born in low quality environments might be given some developmental advantage that results in improved fitness later in life. We call this developmental programming hypothesis and it really gets into this idea of parental effects, which we know are important in variable environments and as Shaley hinted at, important in cooperative breeders based on a lot of theoretical and some empirical work as well. And so this hypothesis is particularly appealing, I think, when we think about adaptive plasticity, it might be a mechanism by which parents are able to basically adaptively program their offspring to take advantage of the environments they're likely to experience in their lifetime. So these hypotheses, I think, make contrasting predictions, all right? The developmental constraint hypothesis predicts that if you're born in a low quality environment, you're gonna have lower fitness no matter what you experience later in life. And that could be mediated by some, let's say, epigenetic regulation. The developmental programming hypothesis makes a contrasting prediction where if you're born in low, uh, low quality environments, some mothers or fathers might be able to adaptively program their offspring to take advantage of that and do better later in life. And perhaps that's the result of some opposite type of 
genetic regulation. And so ideally we wanna look at this sort of this black box, this middle area and try to figure out what's going on. And again, I think this, uh, this, this, this bottom box here uh, is really interesting for this idea of parental effects, which, which Shaley introduced. I think we see behaviorally and phenotypically, but we don't know what's going on mechanistically, okay? So this is what the long-term rainfall looks like slightly differently. So this is just showing for the last 20 or so years, you can see it fluctuates around the mean, you get some wet years, you get some dry years. But I think what's particularly important, getting back to what I talked about before, is the amount of rainfall at the pre-breeding period is very variable, but it looks very different. Most years are very dry and there's occasionally some wet years. And so for the data I'm gonna talk about now, I'm gonna show you first some samples that we took over about a 10 year period, looking at each of the years. And then the second part, I'll show you some samples where we, where we picked those birds um, that were born during those really wet peaks, which are only like three or so in the last 20 years. And then a couple of birds born in some of the driest years. Okay, so you remember that, that, that one of the big take home points from Shaley's talk was that prenatal environmental conditions influence offspring phenotypes and fitness, and that those postnatal ecological and social conditions didn't, didn't seem to matter much. Um, so this sets up the potential, I think, for this developmental constraint or perhaps even the developmental programming hypothesis where the environments that the parents experience early in life of the chicks influence the chicks uh, fitness later. And we basically asked, could DNA methylation be one mechanism underlying this adaptive plasticity? And we're getting at this using our long-term study system. So we're doing this from blood. Now we can talk later about the, the merits, the, both the positives and the negatives of using blood as a biomarker, um, but it's what we have access to uh, in these organisms. And so, you know, Shaley mentioned again that, 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 that hormones could be important. And we know from a lot of data that I don't have time to show you that glucocorticoids are important in influencing some of the behavioral roles that these birds experience as adults, right? So, so social stress seems to be reflected in glucocorticoid levels to some degree environmental stressors also. Um, and that influences to partially whether birds are likely to become helpers or breeders. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the glucocorticoids today, but I want to talk about the glucocorticoid receptor and look specifically at methylation on the glucocorticoid receptor because we have a wealth of evidence from rodents and other mammals that this is an important mechanism by which parental effects might mediate offspring behavior, physiology, and potentially fitness. And so we sequenced the superb starling glucocorticoid receptor and then tried to identify the upstream regulatory region. And so we found what we think was the promoter and it's homologous to the MAT promoter and it overlaps um, to some degree. And then we sequenced all of the CPG sites in this, in this promoter region. Uh, I'm only gonna talk about the, some of the most downstream sites today because they seem to be the most uh, relevant to what we're talking about. And what did we find? Well, we looked at the relationship between rainfall, the year that the mothers experienced before these offspring were born. And we found a significant positive association such that birds born in drier years tended to have lower methylation and birds born in wetter years tended to have higher methylation. And so it could be sort of like this reaction norm, right? If you move from lower to high quality environments, you get a change in DNA methylation in this direction. Okay, we also looked at the relationship between um, the amount of DNA methylation that individuals had and their likelihood of breeding or not breeding. Because at the time when I did this, that seemed to be the most critical um, uh, behavioral or life history strategy to look at. And we found that males with lower DNA methylation were more likely to breed than males with higher DNA methylation. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, the data that Shaley showed us related environmental conditions to fitness, although with a different phenotype. Here I've shown you that the early life conditions can influence the, the, the DNA methylation or the epigenetic regulation and how that can influence fitness in terms of likelihood of breeding. Now, arguably this, this this link, I think, is the weakest, and I think Shaley's results suggest that we looked at the wrong phenotype. We should really be looking at the dispersal phenotype, not the breeding phenotype. They are related, um, but we know a lot more now after another, you know, eight or nine years of data. And this is correlational, and what we really need to do is go into experimentally manipulate those early life stress conditions and see how that affects epigenetic regulation. That we tried in superb starlings. It's very hard to do. Uh, both because of the system and because of uh, uh, Kenyan regulations, let's say. Um, so we're doing that now in house sparrows, both in the lab and the field to manipulate that. 
And I think the other issue with this study is that it's based on a single gene, right? We looked at one candidate, the glucocorticoid receptor. And I think we need to look more broadly if we're gonna make a story like this relating environmental conditions to physiology to fitness. And so what we really wanna know are what are the regions of the genome that are environmentally sensitive or these plasticity genes that they've been called. I want a pair of those too. Um, so we've been looking at global patterns of DNA methylation using reduced representation by sulfite sequencing. And there's a lot of CPG sites in the genome and we can get a good fraction of these targeted primarily in these promoter regions where we think we're likely to see these environmentally sensitive genes based on the theory. And we can cover most of the genome. The genome is just in, uh, in black here. And then you can see we get these restriction cuts you know, near a lot of these genes and we get good coverage and good depth. And what do we find? Well, we find a pattern that's exactly opposite to the corticoid receptor. Something like 95% of the differentially methylated regions show a negative relationship such that uh, if you're born in a, in a dry year, you tend to have higher DNA methylation at these differentially methylated regions. And if you're born in a wetter year, you have lower methylation, right? There are a few genes like that look like glucocorticoid receptor. Glucocorticoid receptor didn't meet significance threshold, but you do see some like it, okay? And so we see a pattern more like this than what I described before with the GR receptor. Okay, another way to look at this is just look at the a histogram of the number of regions that are sort of show, uh, show differential methylation one side or the other. And you can see it's heavily weighted towards the side where birds born in dry years have higher DNA methylation than birds born in wet years. Okay, so we think of these as developmentally constrained genes and potentially these as these developmentally programmable genes of which there don't seem to be very many. So most of the regions that we look at look like this. There's no difference whether you're born in a wet or dry year. Of the ones where we see differences, most look like this. They seem to be developmentally constrained and a very few look like this. So it's interesting to think about what you might expect, what you might see and what the function of these genes are. So the developmentally constrained genes are things that affect metabolic function, cardiac function, immune function, stress response, brain and cognitive function. A lot of things that if they are impaired in terms of their gene expression, it might create problems down the road. So that's another lesson I think. Candidate gene approach can be sometimes easy and cheap, but I think it can be quite misleading. The whole genome approach is really complex and why we've been slow to publish this. And we've been working on a sort of a hybrid approach that, that hopefully will be illuminating in this area. Okay, so I've shown you links between phenotype and fitness using the functional to test hypotheses from using phylogenetic comparative approaches. And then we've started to take a developmental mechanistic approach to really get at these links between genotype, phenotype and fitness but I don't think we've satisfactorily gotten to the evolutionary approach yet. And so in the last uh, two or three minutes, let me just briefly tell you how I think we need to do that, right? We wanna think about the, how these types of environmentally sensitive regions of the genome evolve. And I think to do that, um, we need to think over longer timescales and we need to change our approach. We need to move from one location where we study variation through time to multiple locations where we look at variation in space and those populations have experienced different types of environmental variation for many, many generations. And so we've done that. We've set up now uh, eight or nine, depending on, uh, I think eight is what we've settled on, populations across basically all of Kenya, ranging from the deserts in the far north that get 150 to 250 millimeters of rainfall down to the Tanzanian border where we get places that hit up to, you know, five or six times that amount of rainfall. So we vary in, in long-term average rainfall, but also variation in predictability rainfall. And so we have some sort of, it varies continuously, but we have some wet and dry sites. I don't have time to get too much into the data, but we're seeing different things. So these are the data I showed you previously when we compared birds born in wet and dry years, where most of the genes seem to be on the left side where we think they might be developmentally constrained. And we see a very different pattern when we compare wet and dry sites. In fact, two thirds of the genes show up on the right side of the graph here versus only you know, 5% on the top. And so most genes might be, maybe genes that we can think about being shaped by natural selection uh, might positively influence fitness. And we can directly get at this idea of selection because we haven't done it yet, but we've got all of the SNPs in these regions 
And we can look for an association between environment and genetic variation and an association between genetic variation and epigenetic variation and start to tease this apart. And what are some of the genes that are interesting in here? Well, there's a lot related to immune function and some related to stress physiology. And so we're parsing out these data. And then we can take this approach and do cool things like a common garden experiment, which is very hard to do in birds from populations that are hundreds of kilometers apart, but we can bring them into these aviaries in common garden conditions. It turns out that common garden conditions sometimes in field aviaries mean common stress conditions because this leopard was visiting one of our aviaries uh, for a number of nights in a row. Um, but we can look at changes in DNA methylation across the genome and we find interesting patterns like this. When you take birds from the wild at zero months and put them into the captivity for three months and sample them again and then at six months, you get global changes in DNA methylation. So these things are changing fast, right? Whether you look in the regulatory regions or the gene bodies. What's interesting is the shape approximates what you see in stress hormones, right? When you put them in captivity, there's an initial stress event and they eventually acclimatize to that and the stress hormones start to go down and some of the methylation starts to go down. So it's kind of interesting and we can get, I mean, this, this study is designed mainly to look at stress physiology and HPA function, but we can get some interesting data about this as well. Um, interestingly, there's not a lot of overlap in the genes that are, that are turned on in this type of stressful event than what we saw um, in the starlings previously. So, I'll just end by saying I think that 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 this 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 goal to link genotype to phenotype to fitness can only be done when we think integratively using comparative approaches to look across different species and across different populations. Following individuals for their lifetimes of marked individuals of known life history known genealogical relationships and known fitness outcomes and then thinking to, to mechanistically and developmentally at different components, perhaps some of these physiological things like hormones or genetic things like epigenetic mechanisms. We've talked about DNA methylation. I hope to get into some other mechanisms in the future. And by thinking across levels of analysis, but also thinking at multiple scales across different temporal and spatial scales and in diversity of organisms, you can really start to understand your system in new ways. But at the end of the day, it really does take long-term study, multiple years and um, a big team of people, right? And so we couldn't do this without the, the Kenyans. Here are the four sort of longest serving Kenyans. Wilson Doritu has worked with me since day one um, and many others. And then many, many students and collaborators um, who have helped over the years. And so I will end there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. We have some questions already and I'm sure more will come in. Um, so let's start with a question from Emily Levy who says first, two awesome talks, thank you. Um, I'm curious to hear more about why you said that there are genes or promoters that see less methylation and thus more gene expression in high rainfalls and why those are candidates for developmental programming and then vice versa for more methylation and developmental constraints. So in other words, why would more gene expression imply a different hypothesis than less gene expression? Well, I think I think if, I think about it in terms of impaired gene expression, right? And so you, you we don't know in this study about the gene expression. Uh, we've done that in the gradient study. We have data on the gene expression, and so we can relate methylation directly to gene expression. That's one of the gaps from the let's say the temporal study at the single location. We didn't take samples to look at gene expression, and so that's something we're doing in the house sparrows. So we can actually relate the methylation to the gene expression and we can do it not just in the blood, but in the brain. Um, but that's sort of the framework. But the, basically the thinking is that if you, if you increase methylation, you'll lead to reduced gene expression and that could impair some of, these, some of these key functions. But we don't have the evidence to show that yet. Hopefully we'll have it soon. Great, cool. Um, I was curious if you could speculate a little bit on the role of both of these hypotheses and how they might integrate, because it seems like you have evidence for, you know, some genes related to the one and some genes related to um, constraint versus um, developmental programming and how that might relate to phenotype and fitness. Yeah, I think what we need to do is we need to go into multiple of these populations and actually sample birds born in high and low quality years in variable and non-variable environments. And that's the logical next step to answer that question. Um, the challenge with that is having, what you then have is multiple long-term study sites then, right? Because you need marked individuals at uh, multiple, multiple sites and follow them for their life histories throughout the year. And so if I had uh, lots and lots of grant money, I think we could do that. That is probably the next grant that needs to be done in some, in some capacity. 
Um, you know, it does seem to be at this stage, at least different genes. Um, I think part of the issue is the method, the reduced representation method, I think is somewhat misleading. Um, it's sort of the, you know, ideally we'd wanna do whole genome sequencing and look at methylation across the genome and it'd be consistent in everything. With this approach, we get uh, CPG sites within four or five KB of an annotated gene, but we don't know whether it's important. So what we've spent the last year or two doing is developing a new method where we can go in sort of what I said, the best of both worlds. We can go in with some information from the whole genome sequencing or the reduced representation sequencing or just some RNA-seq differences and design probes to capture all of the exons and all of the regulatory regions of specific genes. So we've been able to do that now for a suite of about 40 or 50 genes and get all the CPG sites. And that method seems to finally be working. I was gonna present some data, but we're just finalizing it, but it seems to work really well. It actually worked better than RBS when you approximate it back to whole genome by silver sequencing. And I think that approach is a fraction of the amount of money um, and you can do tons, tons more samples, um, but you just can only do, you know, um, part of the genome really well. And so I think that we can do by combining the temporal and spatial component and using slightly different approaches to, to get at that question eventually. Cool, well, I look forward to learning about that when you figure it out. The, the other two questions are moving away from the two hypotheses. So I just wanna, I'll jump in real quick because I have a question about these hypotheses, the developmental constraints versus developmental programming. Um, if, let, let's say that it turns out everything it's consistent with, with what you've identified as developmental programming, less rainfall means, improved likelihood of breeding, improved dispersal, whatever, improved survival even. How do you distinguish between uh, a bad environment being good for later life fitness, regardless of the adult environment, from it turns out what we thought was a bad environment actually is a good environment? I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, it seems obvious, it seems very intuitive, right, that less rainfall means worse environment, but I wonder if 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 we're, you're able to distinguish between uh, low rainfall actually meaning good things. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. We make the assumption that, that if you're born under conditions that, that, that might be stressful. I mean, part of it is we see some consistency. Um, so, so those same environmental conditions um, influence the sex of the offspring. So, but it's backwards to a typical Trivers Willard. So if you're born in a dry year, you tend to produce a uh, male offspring. And if you're born in a good year, you tend to produce female offspring. You would think you produce the sex males because of higher variance and reproductive success, but actually in starlings, females have higher variance and reproductive success than males. So the thinking was under poor conditions, you produce the sex with the lower variance and reproductive success. Um, so it's consistent with that. It's also consistent, as I said, with some, some egg size data, but again, different than what we see in other cooperative breeders. It's not the size of the, all the eggs, it's sort of the relative size of the first and the middle eggs uh, that they ship. And so again, it's the, they tend to make uh, bigger differences in those egg size under poor conditions. So we think, and also based on just some um, body sort of stress data, we think that the mothers at least are in poor body condition in those dry years. Um, but whether that then translates to the offspring, you're right. I don't, we don't know. I don't think, Shaley, we haven't done an analysis looking at the environmental conditions and the likelihood of breeding on the larger data set, have you? Yeah, so we should probably do that. That would start to get at it, sort of like what I did on a much smaller data set. Um, but you're right. We need to build some more data to show that if you're born under low rainfall conditions, that's actually a poor quality environment and, and, and not a higher quality environment. But I would say at least three independent pieces of data suggest that it's a poor quality environment for the mothers that may translate to the offspring. Yeah. It's a super interesting kind of web of interactions. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Okay, maybe time for a few more questions. So um, Susan Alberts, who I think had to leave, but we'll watch later potentially uh, asks, uh, can you talk a bit about your guesses for why large groups confer survival benefits? And related to that, I was wondering what limits group size or is it better just to be in the largest group possible? Yeah, um, I'll answer some of that and then I'll let Shaley answer the second half of that because she has some uh, analyses she's been doing. I think that it's a complicated thing. We think that 
we think that okay we used to think that i'm not sure we still think it but re that reproductive conflict went up as group size increases okay we showed that both theoretically and empirically that as group size go empirically by looking at the uh, leukocorticoid data to to as a proxy for social conflict okay um that as group size goes up conflict seems to go up and that probably regulates group size down to some degree, okay? And the data that Sarah had shows that there's selection probably to have larger and larger groups. And so those two things might mediate group size up and down. Um, but in terms of what the, what the fitness, what leads to those fitness benefits, I suspect it's, I suspect it's more individuals to guard against nest predators is the primary thing. So I did some experiments that I never published as part of my thesis with actual nest predator models of snakes and hawks. So one that would just eat eggs, the snake, and one that might eat the parents and the eggs. And what we found in, in some of that was that uh, mothers do most of the nest protection. Other birds help, but other birds won't help until there's at least five other birds there. It's too risky when there's an adult predator, basically. And so the mothers will attack whatever's there to save their offspring, but the helpers and things like that will wait until there's enough birds so that their own risk is nothing. And so these birds live on very large territories. They can be half a kilometer or kilometer by a kilometer. And so the nests are relatively spread out. And I think if you just have more birds, there's a higher likelihood of more birds being near the nest and they can help deter some of these events. The average lifetime reproductive success is about two, two and a half for the lifetime of a bird. The average clutch size is about three and a half or four. So if you can prevent one clutch from being depredated, you can double or triple your lifetime reproductive success. So being able to deter nest predators is really important. I think there's strong selection on that. And I suspect that's why groups are so large. Great. And, and Shelly, there's also a reproductive benefit to being in large groups, right? Yeah, well, this is, um, I'm still working on this, but it, it does seem like, so I'm looking at immigration into these groups and trying to see what factors now, like I've looked at dispersal, but out of the groups, but I want to look at like what, impacts how many immigrants join a group. And it does seem like immigrants tend to join the bigger groups, which would make sense if they are conferring survival benefits, but the reproductive success seems to plateau um, at a, like a mean group size. And so there might be some interaction between like survival benefits and reproductive success that might limit the, like how big a group can get. You can't have a group of over a certain number of individuals, otherwise it's detrimental to everyone, something like that. Cool, that's really interesting. Looking forward to hearing about that too, Shaley. Okay, um, Christine Dre asks or says that there's dramatic effects of climate change on reproductive skew in meerkats, which is also a cooperative breeding system, but it's a mammal with extreme reproductive skew in both sexes. Um, and in that case, drought reduced or nearly eliminated reproductive skew in females. And so this seems related to the obligate nature of cooperation in the species. Do you think, can you speculate a bit on the reasons for these differences? So the idea that, I guess, drought reduced reproductive skew. Yeah. So it leads to more equality. Yes. Um, well, one other difference I think between meerkats and starlings is that the large groups of starlings, I think it has to do with group size and plural breeding. So, so meerkats are singular breeders. There's usually one breeding female per group. Um, although the subordinates can breed in some cases. Superb starlings, there's always multiple, usually three or four, sometimes five or six. And so I think that's fundamentally different. I think su superb starling groups are more stable. So in 20 years, we've had, Shaley and I debate about this. Uh, one, maybe one of the groups I would say may have gone locally extinct and combined with a neighboring group, um, but that's still under study. Um, whereas in meerkats, those groups go locally extinct a lot, right? They blip in and they blip out. And so um, I think the superb starlings are uh, more stable because they're larger. And I think the reason they're larger is because they um, are, are able to allow other individuals to breed. And what Shaley's found um, is that a lot of those breeders that they allow in are immigrants, right? And so it's a way for the groups to maintain large size um, uh, by doing that. And so that changes the 
conflict dynamics within the group. So I still think there is conflict within the group, but I think we're questioning how much conflict there is and who controls group membership and who mediates that conflict. And I think in the superb starlings, that's why I said it's changed. When we published 10 years ago, we thought there was a lot of intergroup conflict as there is in other species. But, you know, we don't know. We haven't been able to do that. I've had Shaley's tried it. I've tried it. A few other people have tried it to sort of quantify dominance hierarchies and intergroup conflict within groups um, at feeding platforms and stuff, because most of the interactions occur in that pre-breeding season seem to be with birds moving into the group. There's not a lot of um, intergroup observed conflict, okay? And that's, I think, common in a lot of things and why meerkats and mongooses, they've used, you know, hormone manipulations and stuff to, to pull out the conflict that's often hidden. We haven't been able to pull it out yet in superb starlings, um, but we don't know how much of it is there. And so I think that's a fundamental difference between meerkats and, and starlings and perhaps some of these other more generally plural breeders versus singular breeders. Great. All right. One last overarching question um, is, do you have any tips for early career researchers on how to balance studying so many species both simultaneously and over time? Um, for early career researchers in particular, um, form good collaborations with good people that you trust and that you're interested in. So I started the Superb Starlings when I was a grad student, and then I started on the shrimp as a graduate student, and then I collaborate on some of these other systems with uh, um, actually people that I met as graduate students and stuff. And so um, I think you, you need to collaborate with good people that you trust, and then you need a good team of students and postdocs when you get to that stage and, and, and working with the right people um, is critical. Great, thank you so much. And um, with that, we'll leave it there. Thank you both for such interesting talks and stimulating question periods. Um, and for everyone else out there, we will see you next week, same time, same place for another two set of seminars. Have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.